uh, it's time to talk about GPL compliance before Friday really begins. I think it's perfect timing. Um, so um, one of the questions we did think about is why do we have a new document? And one that is, as Evan says, 56 pages longer, longer based on what font you're using. Is it an edited version of the older one? Then why don't you just give us a diff and tell us what you have changed or what you haven't? Is the new document, um, it, what happens to the older compliance guide, um, which we published in 2008? Is it no longer relevant? Is it relevant? Well, it is still relevant. But in 2008, when we had first published the guide, um, the world looked very different, especially in the way um, the width and the complexity with which free software was being used and is now being used. Um, the success of an Android use of hundreds of systems relying upon GPL software in embedded devices, and the entry of non-US manufacturers who have entered the field with enormous volume and great energy, and for whom compliance mostly meant code scanning tools, and there was enough um, and more people who have been misled by this. We thought it is, an, it is the right time to revisit our advice on the subject. And we wanted to explain and teach compliance in this changed environment of moving parts, more software in everything, and more complexities. Uh, copyleft has always been intended to be used by programmers and to apply to their programs without lawyers mostly, and Free Software Foundation has these extremely helpful and authoritative um, frequently asked questions which everybody refers to, but Evan cannot shake off his professor hat, and I am still learning, so we thought it was a good idea to have a ready reckoner for lawyers, something which analyzes the licensed text and explains the provisions in an um, license section order form, which can be referred to by lawyers and understand what each provision and what, compli uh, what compliance obligations each provision creates. And if, if you're a developing hacker trying to understand the uh, ins and outs of the GNU family of licenses, the FSFFAQ cannot be bettered. Mm -hmm. And it was not our intention to attempt to better it. Uh, our primary task is speaking to lawyers and to law students, uh, and the uh, FSF FAQ does a job that developers require at the expense of making lawyers think like engineers, which I needn't tell you is not the way to achieve perfect global GPL compliance. Uh, I wanted a thing that we could teach from uh, in that sense, in the training that we do around the world for lawyers uh, coping with compliance questions for the first time in the classroom, uh, and which could be used as a reference guide to the compliance obligations that arise from each particular provision of the entire family of licenses in all versions. Uh, so that a lawyer familiar, for example, with GPL2, uh, but facing GPL3 questions for the first time uh, in her or his experience would have a way uh, to go uh, directly to the question, what is the difference between Section 7 of GPLV2 and Section 12 of GPLV3? Um, although we think it will be useful no matter where in the world you will be, because that's how we are trying to structure it, but it is still based only on US law. And this is not legal advice. Consult a lawyer again before you do anything, and don't rely on it that way. But it is still um, published by the Software Freedom Law Center. Uh, I, I think it, I hope at least that it may provide some new insights to experienced lawyers and can also be a good jumping off point for new lawyers who are coming to the area and trying to look for something which can guide them about the licenses and the obligations. It, um, in other respect, the document also attempts to catch up with the changes in the industry and the attitude towards compliance. It emphasizes the importance of software governance and that a compliance failure is actually a failure in, a, a governance failure. Um, software governance is a phrase which we use to describe the process by which the businesses control and document their intake of the software, their use of the software, what software they distribute, 
what license terms they incur or offer on those inbound and outbound transactions. And it doesn't matter whether the business is selling physical devices with embedded software or goods and services. Um, we think that good software governance is the key to minimum cost preparation to meet any kind of compliance obligations. By the late 1990s, when Richard and I were halfway through the process of thinking about the structure and function of GPL3, it had become clear to us that one of the gravest difficulties that we faced was that parties were using distributions of software rather than single programs or small collections of programs. And that when something goes wrong with the compliance in a whole distribution situation, the compliance and termination structure of GPL2, which automatically terminates all rights on violation, could lead to an extremely chaotic problem for the non-compliant organization. We meet this all the time in the work we do around the world advising or auditing companies with respect to their compliance. Uh, a, a story that we tell in the guide concerns a middle-sized company somewhere else in the world that we dealt with last year, which had uh, a series of physical products embedding uh, Fedora distributions, as it happens. Uh, probably they shouldn't have been embedding Fedora, and we told them why. Um, but, but, but the products that they were making at the time that we came uh, to start working with them were pretty much fully compliant. The problem was that past products that they had shipped were in no way compliant, and rights had terminated on hundreds of programs by the time we ever came to them, giving them an enormous remediation difficulty involving contacting a lot of copyright holders around the world in order to restore their rights on the basis of compliance. The whole distribution problem, the problem of a large number of parallel terminations of rights, was the most important reason that Richard and I decided long before we began making GPL3 that we would need a new termination structure, changing from the automatic termination structure of GPLv2 to the cure period and uh, modified uh, termination structure of GPL3. Uh, where we now live, however, we're not even dealing with problems of whole distribution infringement anymore. We are instead dealing with supply chain complexity, which is truly unfathomable without help. An ordinary device, like say some DVD players that we were uptight about at the end of last decade and sued some people over, those DVD players had components in the dozens containing software distributions, containing hundreds of programs, often unnecessary, but they're just for the hell of it and capable of creating a compliance problem. We now live in a world in which devices are routinely marketed with hundreds of components, each containing software stacks that may involve non-compliant parts. Hence the emphasis on governance. The Open Chain Initiative for Supply Chain Compliance being pioneered by Dave Marr of Qualcomm with other mm -hmm. friends and comrades around the industry should be shouted out here. Dave couldn't make it today, but were he here, we'd have included him in this part mm -hmm. of the conversation. An effort to create engineered compliance throughout the supply chain is an absolute requirement if chaos is to be avoided and if compliance difficulties are not significantly to multiply in the world. Hence our emphasis on the idea that compliance is really a phenomenon of governance, of knowing what software you take in, where you got it from, what you're doing with it, how you're emitting it, and make sure you have requested all the complete and corresponding source code you were entitled to as a user before you shipped it out again. The guide emphasizes, uh, in a non-technical way, a number of the kinds of development practices, uh, just changes in how software is literally made, uh, where, the com where the complete and so corresponding source code of programs is a make target within the manufacturing of the software so that every single build of the software also builds complete and corresponding source code and it can't get lost or shuffled out of place or the engineer who knew what the source was corresponding to the product is long gone and you don't know anymore. So a good deal of our emphasis, as Mishy says, is on compliance failures as governance failures, better operated in the form of better software governance than in any other way. The companies around the world and in this room that do all of this work are the natural governance consultants for this enterprise. And we believe 
will be of great importance to their customers and other users around the world because they will teach better governance. There has been a lot of work which has been done at the Linux Foundation also about the software governance where that's the emphasis and those documents are also very useful and available and uh, we, we have learned from those documents. Uh, talking about this current one, it is divided into roughly three parts. The first one actually gives detailed description of some of the key concepts applied in copyleft licenses and uh, such as explain what is a work, what is a work based on a program, and what is automatic downstream licensing. Um, the idea of explaining these core concepts was because some, all the, this is all, take, uh, copyleft takes the functional parts of copyright law and creates a completely different ecosystem. It usually is helpful if you understand what was the intention behind a certain license provision. And go, if that is the common reference point each time you come, come across a question, it just becomes easier to understand why a section is written in a certain way and why it could, creates or asks you to comply with some kind of an obligation. One of the difficulties that we experience in teaching about GPL around the world is that some of the concepts that make copyleft licensing work, like the automatic downstream licensing provisions of GPL 2 and 3, which mean that every party receiving a copy of the program is in direct privity uh, with the parties uh, who, who, who have previously created earlier versions of the program. These mechanisms, which are fundamental to how the licenses work, are not necessarily understood by people who have acquired a rule of thumb about how to comply. And in edge cases, it becomes important to explain. Why, for example, is it the case that if I am out of compliance, merely acquiring a new copy of the program does not somehow reset my licensing status or allow me to resume distribution? A question which I have heard discussed in complex ways in different environments around the world, but which is relatively simply answered by an understanding that if those automatic upstream licenses are prevented from being issued by your previous non-compliance, then it doesn't matter what the guy at the bottom of that chain handed you by way of a new copy. You don't have all those automatic upstream licenses, which are all that make it possible for you to copy, modify, and redistribute the software. So in rewriting in order to teach uh, in what we felt was a more effective way, it seemed appropriate to begin by discussing these fundamental concepts of copyleft before moving on to a discussion of the individual provisions. Um, other than automatic downstream licensing, there are other concepts which have been touched upon, like imposition of repugnant terms <coughs> or protection against uh, additional restrictions. Once the concepts have been explained in the second part where we actually describe uh, provision by provision in license text order, uh, what are the compliance obligations? The text also refers back to the concept and how these concepts are embody embodied in particular sections. Changes in technology are changing the meanings of provisions which have been stable now in the case of GPL2 since 1991, that is uh, for more than 20 years. Um, for example, uh, it is conventional to say uh, that the GPL2 copyleft obligations are triggered only by distribution of the software. Uh, as thoughtful and complete an authority on the subject as Martin Fink told my law school class that last night, uh, I didn't stop him because one doesn't stop Martin, as you have already seen today, but, but it isn't true. Uh, what GPL2 actually says uh, uh, is that distributing the software uh, except under these rules is not allowed. It also says sublicensing the software in any way other than under these rules is not allowed. And for most of the history of GPL2, that didn't mean anything very important. A mode of non-compliance through sublicensing was not a mode of non-compliance that we ever hit. And then there's the cloud. One of the things that happens is that cloud service providers have lawyers and those lawyers write contracts and the contracts purport to license to the user of the cloud the right to use all the software on the platform being delivered or employed. Every time such a lawyer writes such a contract, she or he is actually violating GPL and terminating rights automatically because they are sub-licensing and unless the sub terms are compatible with the terms of GPL2, which they never are, 
A mode of non-compliance which has been essentially unimportant for most of the last 20 years suddenly turns out to be a terribly risky thing to have done. This is not engineer-caused non-compliance. This is not engineer-catchable non-compliance. It is not non-compliance of the form we like to deal with when we have nice, clean, technical interlocutors on the other side with whom we can deal. This is a kind of non-compliance created by lawyers, furthered by lawyers, findable only by lawyers, and naturally not a kind of non-compliance which lawyers in outside practice who have written defective contracts wish to acknowledge. We hope by calling attention to such matters in the guide that we may be able to prevent problems which are otherwise essentially unsoluble without accusing somebody of malpractice. GPL3, I should point out, bans sublicensing altogether. You might want to consider the consequences of that with respect to the next cloud services or platform as a service contract uh, that you read in your professional work. Um. Uh, the second part, as we were saying, that obviously does about these various uh, license provisions, and one of this, um, one of the questions which is often asked, obviously, was as as a software as a service. There are other things like Section 11 of GPLv3, and which deals with patents, and there are examples, and also some developments which have happened in the industry but haven't been addressed or talked about. The guide also at least touches upon them and tries to explain how the section applies to those changed circumstances and what effect it might have on the current ecosystem. One of the things that I'm particularly happy about, although the readers may not be, is that we have finally gotten around to teaching our way through the world's most misunderstood software license, the LGPL version 2.1. A license which is actually um, uh, difficult and complicated and contains a number of conceptual tricks and traps uh, that have been in existence for 21 years and which have been, uh, generally speaking, ignored, largely, I believe, because people didn't read the text of the license at all. Uh, the guide will, I hope, help people to understand why moving software from LGPLv 2.1 to LGPLv 3 is a really good idea. Because there are a bunch of people who, if they actually bother to read the guide, read the provisions, and understand how LGPL 2.1 really works, are going to realize that it isn't the license they wish that they were using. There are a bunch of other people who took code out of libraries licensed under LGPL v2.1 and put that code in things that aren't libraries and believe they have a license so to do, which they don't. There are a number of points, in other words, about the peculiar structure of LGPL v2.1 that it is not a weak copyleft license, but a copyleft license with that broad linking exception that the copyleft license it is, is sections one to five of LGPL v2.1, which is not the GPL and doesn't behave like any version of the GPL, which is poorly understood and the consequences of which are poorly understood. Here, for a change, I have the feeling that what we are doing is correcting failures in our teaching in the past. And by teaching, I suppose I mean absence of litigation. If we had been whacking people around the world about all this LGPL v2.1 noncompliance over the past 10 years, by now I think the lessons would have sunk in. But contrary to supposition, we hate whacking people. We're community builders and litigation isn't actually what we like to do and we have been very careful to do as little of it as we could while still gaining the attention of people to the issues of compliance. I hope I mean this deeply and from the bottom of my heart. I hope that this document is read widely enough to prevent us from whacking a bunch of people. Otherwise, I have no idea what will happen. Uh, the part three reviews the compliance responsibilities of parties downstream from copylefted projects. And there is general advice about responding to source code provisioning inquiries from users or compliance complaints from copyright holders. It starts with a section about describing who has compliance obligations and iterates in if, what if, it, based on how you are using a certain piece of software, what might or might not be your obligation. The goal here was to provide uh, what to do when the phone rings kind of guidance. 
Uh, we said in the first edition of the guide, uh, which was written uh, by Bradley Kuhn and by Karen Sandler, who is no longer here to take the bow that she's entitled to for it, uh, the, the, oh, and Aaron also, who also left before he could take a bow. The, uh, the, the, the first edition of the guide uh, correctly said that if the phone rings, you should answer it, uh, which we still regard as the most important fundamental advice that can be made, that is, engage, silent people are the only people who ever got sued. Uh, but we wanted to go a little bit beyond that to suggest the ways in which uh, the problems that we have seen over the last decade uh, could be resolved by new and different modes of engagement. We are now moving into a period in which, for the first time in the history of these licenses, not all license enforcement is conducted by Quakers. The license enforcers of the past 20 years were communities, not monetizers. What they wanted was compliance, not dough. They didn't have any, uh, 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 what shall we say, uh, selective prosecution strategies with respect to compliance based around whose toes they wanted to chop off this week. Uh, we can say for sure that that will no longer be the case. Uh, that in the next decade, the community enforcers will be joined by monetizers of different flavors and forms uh, whose desire to play gotcha will be on a level and a scale that the communities would never ethically have adopted. The consequence of which is that we need to understand not only how to make compliance work between essentially cooperating parties, communities who want compliance and compliance only, and commercial parties who would be happy to come into compliance if it wasn't going to raise their risks of damages, judgments, or adverse publicity. That's the work we've done, I've done for the past 20 years, and SFLC has done for the past 10. That work was comparatively light and simple. Trying to figure out how to make compliance disputes work when the guy on one side is Larry Ellison and the guy on the other side is anybody you care to name is a whole other kind of problem. And what we wanted to do in this edition of the guide was to suggest ways in which facilitated modes of communication between complainants and respondents in compliance matters might be used to smooth the route to compliance in a broader variety of social circumstances than the ones that prevailed eight years ago. How are we going to use the goodwill, the trust, the knowledge, that we have built up in the communities and in the lawyers and in the enforcement organizations, SFC and GPLviolations.org and FSF and SFLC, how are we going to use all of the knowledge and trust that we have built up to make compliance disputes smoother, faster, easier, and less dangerous, even when the parties engaged have broader a range of incentives and motives that have characterized enforcement in the past. The third section of the guide is really directed at suggesting how disputes might be facilitated even when the parties are not in a cooperative mood. How to get your engineers involved without producing them to parties who are uh, 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 likely litigants. Uh, how to uh, understand the process of helping a community to get compliance from you in such a way as to wind up with a stronger relationship with that community for the experience rather than a weaker one. These questions, which were not the focus of the guide uh, eight years ago, which wanted to tell you what complete and corresponding source code was and how to submit it and how to check it and how to make a written notification uh, of the availability of source code, a section I considered to be so excellent that we simply reprinted it as an appendix here. Uh, those were all really important. They were the mechanics of compliance on a program or a distribution in the middle of last decade. But they are no longer the biggest issues that we have, either with respect to the technology of free software compliance, nor with respect to the motivations and incentives of the parties who engage in disputing. Um. When we describe about something as um, give advice on how to meet compliance obligations, then uh, we also talk about how in our experience we've observed that there is a significant mismatch about what companies expect to be a compliance action looking like and what they prepare for and what actually happens. And uh, often we have found that companies will prepare at great expense and avoid unlikely risks that have low historical incidence of occurrence and low cost of remediation. 
but they actually leave out and the unmanaged risks which have resulted in almost all of the litigation so far and other adverse outcomes. Here the tooling companies have legitimately, I think, some burden to carry with respect to what they have done by way of the education of their customers. A, a, a broad array of mostly proprietary technologies used uh, assertedly uh, to improve GPL compliance have led people to the belief that the most important thing to do in assuring your compliance with the licenses is to scan what you make to find out what is in it. Uh, oddly enough, this is almost 0% of all the compliance litigation that has ever happened. Almost all the compliance litigation that ever happened wasn't about how code was built, it was about how code was delivered. It was about the fact that licensed texts were not present, that complete and corresponding source code was neither provided nor offered, that response to a request for complete and corresponding source code was incorrectly or uh, 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 fulfilled or not fulfilled at all. The code scanners allow you to know a little bit about what you make, but they do not work on what you deliver, and they do not assure that your fulfillment is accurate. So oddly enough, people have spent a lot of money, a lot of money, on tooling. When I first started working in Korea, I, I, I found myself literally unable to believe what Black Duck Korea is able to charge its customers. I won't here mention it to you, I will just tell you that there are so many digits to the left of the decimal point that your eyes will pop out too. Uh, and the problem is that what happens is that people r routinely run expensive scanning programs to scan uh, 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 commodity Android stacks. They get back piles of output from the scanning tools that they do not understand and cannot meaningfully interpret. They put those scanning outputs into filing cabinets under the impression that if something ever goes wrong, they will waive the reams of scanning output and somehow, magically, that will help them. Last year around the world, as you may know, we had a, 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 an almost fully visible example when Samsung Electronics put an XFAT driver in some Android objects, uh, which they bought from a third-party contractor and which contained inclusions of GPL code. I can tell you, though they never got publicly around to saying as fully as they might have done what happened, that those particular Android stacks were passed three separate times uh, through the world standard in proprietary commercially available compliance tools. I have no idea whether those tools caught the problem because the people for whom they ran didn't know what to do with the results and simply canned them as usual. Uh, and so a major manufacturer, the leading manufacturer of handsets in the world, found itself having bought expensively and used expensively tools which didn't catch what was actually a fairly important non-compliance situation. Volunteer labor from the community turned up uh, and helped Samsung Electronics to deal with that situation, including going so far as saying, as Harold Velta did in the middle of that investigation, oh yeah, I recognize that code, I wrote it. You can use it. You should comply, but you can use it. No big deal. That is to say, of course, that the expectations were completely wrong. Expectations about what the technology would do, expectations about what ha would happen if the technology failed, expectations about what the community would care about and what it wouldn't and how it would respond. In the end, Samsung Electronics wrote an excellent account uh, of the uh, nature of that problem and what happened and how they solved it. Uh, and at the last minute, for reasons that don't need a lot of bearing upon here, the senior executives decided not to publish it after all. Uh, and the world lost, and I think Samsung Electronics lost, uh, an opportunity to educate about compliance. Uh, we didn't mention anybody's names in here, uh, but it was certainly time to tell a few stories, which we've done, in a compressed way, but nonetheless, I hope in a useful one. We have said, look, this goes wrong. It doesn't get caught. You could have caught it. Here's the kind of governance that would have prevented this from happening. Here's how cheaply and simply, in a broad, schematic kind of way, these kinds of compliance matters can be engineered never to happen again. We would be delighted to help you use them. Uh, apart from that, there would we offer at least some kind of suggestions about um, governance. We also talk about how, govern how compliance can be used to improve relationships.
between the companies and also the developers or the communities or the copyright holders and how companies can actually become a part of the commons and use that opportunity to not think, oh, this is something completely adversarial, but, as all, but try to use that opportunity to become a part of the larger ecosystem. Most of the people in this room will take that as cliche material. Uh, but if you do, as we do, a lot of work around the world in other places a, a dozen time zones away or so, uh, you will find that that is not cliche. That that very idea that there is a form of relating to the community in which disputing is a form of strengthening relationships rather than a form of being hijacked or whacked or prevented from distributing your project is absolutely news. I have spent days teaching inside company headquarters buildings far from here in which getting that point across was difficult, if not impossible. And as Karen said earlier today, the minute I walked away, the other parts of that company began to become active again, and distrust set in another time. Not only because of FUD from Microsoft, but also, I will admit, from fear we created ourselves by occasional compliance litigations. Uh, we have unfortunately reached a world in which getting companies out of fear stage is really hard. And one or two of the most important manufacturers around the world will begin to experience immediate commercial harm in coming years unless they can move from a stage of fear about compliance to a stage of higher engagement with the communities around the world that make the software that they use. And compliance discussion will actually be a way of moving them towards that engagement if we can teach them to overcome the fear. I am by no means convinced that this alone or even this uh, combined with anything else will do that job. With time will tell. Uh, I don't want to say, as Martin White, that you will spend many a sleepless night thinking about this guide. I'm sure that isn't true. It's probably not reasonable to take questions here about a document we've just distributed and you haven't read. Uh, if we take questions here and talk about GPL compliance, I'm sure that we could waste some portion of your Friday evening that we didn't mean to waste. Um, but we ought to tell you a little bit about what it is that's really on our minds. There's one more point which I do want to stress upon is something which we say about um, when the dust settles, then offer to cover costs. It's at the very end, but most of the work which is done investigating compliance complaints and then verifying the remediation of those complaints is performed by nonprofit entities and that represent developers spend a lot of time and energy making sure that ecosystem stays pure. And we think when a compliance issue has been successfully resolved and offered to cover the cost of engineering um, involved in the community side is not only fair but also ensures that relationship building continues. We have never, we have never recouped the cost of GPL compliance investigations, not even when we sued people. When I first began talking to people in East Asia, I was very surprised to discover that we had taken nine orders of magnitude more money away from people in GPL compliance disputes than I thought we had. <laughs> Because people told me very confidently about the billions we had raked in suing on these subjects. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the truth of the matter was four guys, engineers with other things to do, important work at SFLC and FSF, had spent hours checking whether the code that was sent to us actually built. And whether once it was built, it was the code we thought it was or something else which can be very exacting and painful work. The correct way to verify the code is complete and corresponding is to build it in the build environment in which it was used to make the product. If you attempt to build it in some other environment or in some other way, it will be very difficult for you to determine whether the code is complete and corresponding. When a guy tells you, oh, I, we used that make file, but we say, no, you didn't use that make file. We know you didn't use that make file. Where's the make file you actually used? And he can't find it because the guy who wrote it vanished years ago and they don't really understand how GNU make works anyway. And you have to spend your time trying to imagine how they built it and then trying various versions of how they built it until you find the one they actually used and can verify that what you have been given is correct. You have spent a lot of highly skilled engineering time. 
You have spent a lot of highly skilled engineering time for which there are only a few people around you'd really want to use, and those people all have better things to do, and if they work for you, they've not been doing them. The cost of compliance investigation is not outstandingly high. But around the world, people have left most of that cost to be borne by our clients, the nonprofit, non-revenue producing entities. I don't want to go back to suing people in order to recoup costs. I don't want to go back to suing people in order simply to see to it that engineers get paid for checking what other people tell us fulfills their legal obligations. I have disclosed in here in a footnote for the first time in the history of our entity what we have actually made in compliance litigation, at least in percentage terms in order to point out that it didn't amount to a row of beans. And even when our clients got paid and we pushed our money back onto the table so that our clients could take all of it, it didn't amount to a hill of beans. And that's unfair, an inappropriate outcome. Gently suggesting that people should actually externalize the cost of the investigations that they go through and allow the organizations that do the engineering work to do no more than to recoup their costs is an extremely mild suggestion. Indeed so mild that I'm not sure all my clients think I shouldn't have been tougher about it right up front. But let's just say once again that my hope is that the second edition of the guide will cause good behavior to flourish everywhere and that we will be stabbed in their feet by the lilies bursting through the sidewalk. And of course, if it doesn't work out that way, then one of these days we're going to file somewhere and everybody's going to be real upset. Why are we suing people? And the answer will be because we asked you really, really nicely, when the dust settles, offer to pay the costs. And you didn't do it. Well, this document is not intended to be an exhaustive document or can help you build a complete software uh, compliance program. We think the frequently asked questions and other authoritative opinions presented by our clients, especially the Free Software Foundation, are irreplaceable and very, very valuable. But there are other organizations continuously working on these issues, and please consult them. But we do hope that uh, the document has some value beyond just the legal provisions it analyzes and presents. Endorsement by the Free Software Foundation um, is a hard thing to get. 
Yeah, yeah, well, 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 never 100%, you understand? Never 100%. Uh, in, fact, in, in fact, I'm not going to explain to you how much uh, Richard Stallman's uh, email stream and mine have intersected on these subjects in the last couple of weeks. Uh, James, was there something you wanted to ask? So uh, GPL3 is, a, is a, 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 a target that was made uh, at a time when Microsoft patent misbehavior was uh, at its particular height. Uh, and uh, there are um, certain provisions in GPL3 uh, in Section 11 that were written uh, with a particular eye towards various forms of discriminatory patent licensing. Uh, either I will license my customers and not yours, or I will license your customers in return for something from you that doesn't correspond to a copyright benefit. Uh, all of which uh, we prohibited in GPL3, not altogether by saying that they violated the license. Uh, we did that in one case with respect to the substance of the Microsoft Novell deal that was made in November of 2006 as we were finishing the license. But with respect to some other matters of discriminatory patent licensing, uh, we simply said that by operation of law, that is by operation of GPL3, uh, if you make certain kinds of discriminatory patent licenses, uh, then uh, you've simply licensed everybody. Uh, that the license takes uh, the opportunity to grant by implication the remaining patent licenses you did not grant. Uh, you have to be a contributor to a GPL3 program uh, to trigger this response. You have to have made a contributor version as defined in the license. Uh, and uh, there are some GPL3 programs, uh, some important GPLv3 programs, uh, of which Nokia made contributor versions. Uh, the Nokia patent policies interactions with GPL3 were very complex and important, and Dietmar Talroth uh, and I spent a lot of time over the course of the 18 months between January of 2006 and June of 2007 talking about them. Uh, but we achieved, as we achieved with other major patent holders in the industry, uh, a, a, a modus vivendi, which allowed Nokia to become uh, a contributor, making contributor versions of some important GPL3 programs. Uh, Microsoft then went and bought them, acquired the Nokia contributor versions. Uh, is the contributor with respect to those contributor versions, or at any rate, the relevant successor in interest uh, to the Nokia contributor versions. Uh, and uh, 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 James, with his uh, un unerring eye for moments when I am making trouble, uh, has noticed a paragraph on page 28 that I put there for folks like him and maybe Horacio to notice, uh, which simply says that the licensing consequences for the Microsoft patent portfolio. Did I use the word decimation? I don't know. <laughs> uh, the, the, the consequences for the Microsoft patent portfolio with respect to GPL3 software uh, may not have been widely noticed in the industry. Uh, James was asking that I should point out that a matter I referred to earlier today, namely the fact that we know from the Chinese release of documents concerning royalties between Microsoft and uh, Samsung over GPL3 material, specifically exclude GPL3 material. Uh, and all uh, that I would say is uh, contained in the guide, and when you come to page 28, you can consider for yourself what it might mean. Uh, sleepless nights it will not cause you, uh, unless, of course, you are Horacio or Brad Smith, in which case, good luck. Friday night, hey, ah, just, a, just a very quick one so we can all go trick or treat. The document seems to be written primarily from the standpoint of a sophisticated party bringing actions against, you know, potential uh, I'll call them infringers or, or non-compliant entities. But to what extent is there a risk, even a bigger risk, that the complaints would be brought by entities that are not represented uh, by, say, the, the Software Freedom Law Center or one of the other uh, sophisticated uh, clearinghouses for this sort of advice? The, uh, 
the only parties entitled uh, to bring enforcement actions for violation of licenses are free software copyright holders. Uh, users are not, uh, unless they are copyright holders, empowered to enforce the licenses. So the, 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 the set of possible enforcing parties uh, is limited to those who have substantial copyright inventories in copyright licensed software, their agents and their lawyers. There are a comparatively small number of people around the world who fit routinely into that category. Uh, and the lawyers that they use, both in industry and in the community, at least if we are doing our jobs correctly, are uh, properly characterized as knowledgeable parties. Uh, so we have been generally pretty lucky uh, for the past 20 years about the quality of work done uh, by parties who chose to enforce the licenses. This is not only true with respect to legal understanding of the licenses, but much more with respect to the quality of factual investigation done before complaints are made. One of the things which I'm particularly proud of, not on my own behalf, but on behalf of the communities with whom I work, and which is mentioned in the guide, is that the community parties who engage in enforcement have never presented unprepared cases. We know the facts. We have verified the facts. The parties who come forward and make claims do so without ever saying, we know there's something wrong in there, we'll sue you first and then we'll find it in discovery. And never by saying broadly, you're non-compliant and we're coming after you, but rather this is wrong. This binary doesn't have complete and corresponding disorder, the license, we have factually identified. In that sense, my view is that what we are doing in trying in part three to outline rules of compliance disputing for the world to come are basically about holding all other parties, commercial monetizers and others, to the same high levels of factual investigation and verification before complaint that the communities have set. But the, but the question actually is a little bit different. I completely agree with you. That's, that's a good thing from the standpoint of a corporation or a company that, that may be accused of non-compliance. The question, though, is what is the risk that these actions will be brought by the copyright holders themselves, who may not be sophisticated parties? And that could number in the, you know, the hundreds of thousands. Actions in the sense of lawsuits? Uh, initial complaints that could ultimately lead to lawsuits. What happens when initial complaints are made by parties who are not particularly strongly advised is that strongly advised parties turn up. Uh, that's not to, I, I don't want to deprecate any of the people whose stories I might now be about to tell. Uh, they're not parties who are in any way subject to criticism, but they aren't the well-advised, uh, competently lawyered up folks that, that you're asking about. And, and every year around the world, I would say there are probably one or two situations which begin that way. Uh, they do begin with a copyright holder. They begin with a copyright holder asserting a right she is entitled to assert, not in court, but in communication, followed by some non-comprehension on both sides about what is going on. Uh, one of the reasons that SFLC is able to pay next month's rent this month uh, is that we do commercial work around the world helping people uh, to mediate those situations. Uh, sometimes those are uh, long-term donors with whom we have uh, particularly ongoing relationships, fine companies represented in this room. Uh, sometimes they are parties who come to us and say, uh, we would pay you for your time if you would help us to figure out what is really going on here. What does this complainant want? Uh, what are you, what should we do in order uh, to deal with the situation? We do not defend those cases. Our job is not to come in and say there isn't any non-compliance, go away or we'll beat you up. Our job is to say we're here to make sure that there is a smooth, clear, quick uh, resolution of this situation and if we need to explain further what is happening, we will do that with you. Uh, sometimes this occurs because of absence of advising uh, on the part of the complainant who didn't know how to conduct the ritual. Uh, but as often around the world right now, it is a consequence of language difference. 
Uh, a case arose last year in which an individual complainant approached a major Western European telecom uh, to present a complaint, of a justified one, uh, factually accurate. Uh, the Western European telecom does what all telecoms do at all times. Uh, it threw the thing directly at the head of its vendor and said, you deal with this. Uh, the vendor is in East Asia. The vendor does not understand the language of the telecom. The vendor does not have any parties who understand the language of the telecom in which the documents are written. The telecom does not ex expose all of the documents to its vendor because, of course, all they did was throw the problem at their head. The manufacturer does not know what the telecom knows. The telecom will not talk to us. The vendor will talk to us, but the vendor thought that there was something wrong with their product. Could you please help us to understand why our product is non-compliant? We did the analysis. Your product is compliant. There's no problem. You're okay. Ah, but what was really at stake was a firmware update. Sitting as a digital file on the telecom's website, in the telecom's native language, un not understood at all by the vendor at the other end, who had no idea that the complaint was about the firmware to start with. The complainant knew. He knew exactly what he was talking about. But all the different forms of international communications failure that intervened meant that the vendor didn't really understand what was going on. We lost touch with that dispute after we advised the vendor. And we are sorry that we did because the dispute grew and grew over time because communications with the complainant continued to fail. The complainant became irate and upped his demands. Not unjustifiably. But everybody then went to war for no good reason. Uh, not at any rate for a good reason that couldn't have been prevented by better communications at the front. So what I think I would tell you is, yeah, it's a problem. Happens. Really happens. We work on it. We see it, I'm sure, only at a fraction of the time. But we see it enough to know what ought to be done in situations like this. And we consider it our jobs to do them. Can I just to add up the story? I think there was also an interesting component where the community informed the copyright holder that the actions were really not consistent with what would be generally accepted practices. It, it was out of out of kind of conformity with the code of behavior. Um, because typically all you want is proper recognition. You don't want damages. And so because this case was not lawyered well, and in fact was lawyered particularly poorly, it, it started to look like uh, uh, a case where an individual was looking to, to, for unjust enrichment, when in fact that wasn't the case at all. It was, a, it was a manifestation of frustration. And so the community, I think we get back to the community as, as this wonderful self-organizing component, but there's also a self-regulating component that it has that sometimes we're not as good at. This is an example of where we were able to effectively communicate to the copyright holder that his behavior was really out of line and be able to put him in touch with lawyers who are able to help him, like people at SFLC. And now the case is being dealt with and actually, as, as of last week, was actually settled for a very modest sum, which is consistent with, with how most of these cases are dealt with. The Software Foundation played a major role over the years in trying to prevent this from happening by acting as an aggregator of claims. When a situation arose in which a number of copyright holders felt that there was non-compliance out there, it was the case for many years that the fact that FSF was coming in, that Richard was there, that, that the rest of FSF was there, that I was there, gave us an opportunity to say to other claimants, let us handle this for everybody. And we'll go and present it and deal with it, and we'll make sure that everybody is getting compliant treatment by the time it's over. GPLviolations.org happened because Harold Velta decided in the middle of a long and complex dispute with Cisco in the first year of the present century that I wasn't moving fast enough that we weren't being firm enough and moving quickly enough uh, to uh, 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 get to a solution. Uh, Harold, I will say, uh, like uh, Martin Fink, is a man who bends time. I'm not sure quite as successfully, but fast is always really important to Harold. And we weren't moving fast enough, and thus GPLviolations.org was born. I cannot say that we will again have the kind of power to aggregate claims and to represent classes of plaintiffs that we had at the beginning of the 21st century. <coughs> Deference of that kind uh, to the Free Software Foundation has, I think, ceased. 
Uh, Keith is correct, however, that that is by no means the end of the opportunity of influential organizations like FSF. They may not be able to get everybody just to say, okay, I'm not going to even push my claim, I'll let you do it. But they can certainly help, as the kernel developers can help and others can help, to say, look, there's a way we do this. There's a reason we do it this way. Works better when you do it this way. And if you diverge too far from that path, you're going to be injuring parties other than yourself. Not now to pick a community party, but a commercial one. I will mention a name current in the news these days called Zimpleware, with an X in front. A company which had a certain number of, let us say, marginally justified beefs about non-compliance with people who had ripped off their code. Uh, but they found out that they had those beefs because Ameriprise, a large and wealthy company, told them that those beefs were there. Uh, and Zimpleware responded by suing uh, the people who had uh, misappropriated their GPL code called Versada, uh, but they also sued Ameriprise because they were using non-compliant software and they had money to pay. Suing the violation reporter is not okay. Suing the violation reporter may seem like a good idea to a monetizer on a particular morning, and indeed I think for Zimpleware it felt like a good idea, um, but suing the violation reporter produces what in this Law school is referred to by my colleagues as negative externalities. Uh, and uh, the production of negative externalities is not why we have the, uh, the GPL system, copyleft, the communities, and compliance. Uh, so I think Keith is, is precisely right. There are times when you have to pull pretty hard in on the reins to keep somebody from doing something which will be bad for the process of compliance overall. And if you all wake up one morning and something bad has happened to Zimpleware, my fingerprints will not be on the knife. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, that was our 10th anniversary conference. Um, if you're planning to attend the 20th anniversary conference, uh, I better get over this cold. Um, it was really, really nice of you to come. We, we, we couldn't very well throw a birthday party for ourselves without you. Um, we don't even know exactly how to get up in the morning without you. You the people who use, you the people who sell, you the people who make money out of the things we think were neat and so we did them. Uh, we don't know how to survive as lawyers without those of you who donate. Uh, pretty much all the companies represented in this room at this late hour do. Uh, pretty much all the companies who were represented here today who don't have left. Uh, and uh, perhaps they did so, so that they wouldn't be here at the moment when I passed the hat. Um, lawyers are expensive, um, but my guys will tell you that they're not paid that well. Uh, just enough to pay the loans back has been pretty much the principle since the beginning, as I told you. Um, and uh, we are, in that sense, really a consequence of the community, where the community means our clients who make software because they love it, uh, and companies that make money because that's what they do. Uh, and it is at the intersection precisely between those companies and those hackers who do things that they think are neat um, that our lawyering is done. And if we are the weird kinds of lawyers who think the lawyering we do is neat, which we are, uh, then the only way that it can happen is at that intersection uh, where the willingness to pay for other people's lawyers, a thing that no organization did voluntarily, to my knowledge, before the beginning of this enterprise of ours, the willingness to pay for other people's lawyers uh, is central uh, to why it all works and why we're here and why if you mark on your calendar October 31st, 2024? It's a date. Ciao.